Hello. Welcome to today's webinar. My name's Jared Power. I'm an Associate Product Manager for our ophthalmic diagnostic products here at Device Technologies. And I'm excited to welcome all of you here this evening for our latest technology uh, advancement that we're showing from Hugs Right, the iStar 900. Before we get started, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping uh, things to uh, ensure you can interact with myself and the speakers. If you wish to ask the presenters a question, we'll be hosting a Q&A session at the end. So if you have a question, please use the chat function at the bottom and we'll be going through all of those at the end. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed at the end of the meeting or post this meeting, should I hope. I'd now like to welcome our speakers for today. Our first guest is currently working as Chief Medical Officer of Palace Klinikan in Switzerland, a member of the faculty of the University of Basel, Switzerland. His clinical and research focus is biomarkers in dry eye, especially in patients after allergenic stem cell transplantation and GVHD, Professor David Goldblum. Also joining us all the way from Bern in Switzerland, our second guest speaker today, Thomas Butler. Thomas holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and an executive master's in service management. He previously worked for the University of Bern as a research associate and ran the biomedical, biomechanical test laboratory. Following that, he led the research project for the Synthi Stratec in the field of uh, computer assisted surgery. And since 2005, Thomas has been working for Hagstrite as a product manager. In this role, he's been key in the development and market launch of many technologies, including imaging solutions, LED slit lamp illumination, the LensStar optical biometer, and most recently, the new swept source OCT eye analyzer, the iStar. We're so glad you could be here today to share your insights with us. Lastly, Dr. Pascal Lamesh sends his apologies being unable to join us today tonight in person, but has kindly provided a pre-recorded video for his presentation to share with us this evening. So great, let's get straight into it. Professor David Goldblum, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everybody, to, to join us here tonight. I'm just trying to share my presentation. Okay, here it is. Perfect. Um, I, I welcome you. For us, it's in the morning. For you, it's in the evening. Uh, I hope we, we can meet sometime uh, in, in person and in life again. In the meantime, I, I would love to share with you my first experiences, or actually it's, it's more than first experiences, it's experiences I, I have and had with the Vistar um, for, for the last couple of years already. So let's let's start with it. The, the iStar is a new OCT-based device, which, which includes everything. It, it has as a laser source, as a swap source, laser source, which, which, is, which you are probably all aware of, is, is the state-of-the-art laser for, for all our retinal scans and has been used in, in different devices. Um, there are a few devices out now as well, who, which are using it in um, anterior segment imaging and biometry. And, and Hagstrite has, has developed uh, a magnificent machinery, which which includes everything with with the single swept source almost. Um, it it takes precision measurements of of the eye in the anterior segment. I'll show you that it it takes top it, it calculates topographies. It it brings imaging into the machinery. It it measures your your biometries. It it actually uses all the data to to calculate the IOL constants and, and the IOLs afterwards. Um, it has the preset, it has all formulas and methods in it. And, and the beauty of it is it's, it's actually very, very automated. Um, you, you can measure yourself easily by, by sitting in front of it um, since, you, since you're probably used to it. And, and that means that also training uh, anybody, an ophthalmic nurse or, or anybody, actually is very, very easy and fast for that device. Um, as you can see, um, that's, that's their marketing slide. It, it has a 
anterior segment imaging device. It, it has the, the topography in it. it. It will take the anterior chamber biometry as well as, as the whole actual length. And, and then it will take or make the calculations um, all within seconds. The, the device measures actually very, very fast. The calculation takes a bit of time. So let's start into what the imaging looks like. Um, this is this is imaging of the anterior segment. Um, it goes up to 18 millimeters in, uh, in diameter. The, the pattern is, is a unique pattern they have developed um, and it's called the golden angle or Mandalay pattern, which, which is not the usual radial scans or horizontal scans, uh, what, what you have, but it, it's, it's a, a spiral pattern um, scanning, which, which takes heaps of measurements and, and you will see probably later on what they can do with it. Thomas will show us maybe. Um, that's, that's actually one of the beauties. Then you have obviously um, what you can get is, is angle chambers, the lens, and I'll show you quick some examples. Um, you see here, this is a pseudophagic patient with, with the IOL in the eye. You see, um, you see intacts or care rings, uh, the intracoronal segments. You can actually see this is a Fuchs dystrophy patients before I did the DMAC. Um, you, you see the nicely the, the cornea is, is thickened and you see the irregularities from behind. It's an edematous cornea, but still you, you, actually if, if they have epithelial inclusions and, and bulle, you would see that here as well. That's not in that patient the case. Um, you, you can see it better than on this slide. Uh, this is a phakic IOL um, in front of, of the lens or here. Um, again, a pseudophagic patient, but you see vitreous floaters behind it. Um, one thing I want to point out is that you, you see something which is the retina, but it's not the macula. You cannot distinguish. So the device is an imaging device um, for the anterior segment, clearly. Uh, as you can see, it goes up behind the lens or the IOL, but that's, that's about as far as you can distinguish um, clearly things. It's not a device to, to see if there's a macula macular pathology or anything, um, that's, that's just an, an image or it's, it's the end of, of the eye where, where the measurement is taken, but you will never see any foveal depression uh, or, or any pathology thickening of, of the, the macular or the retina or anything. That's, that's not done for that. It gives you nicely the, the lens tilt. Um, if, if there is a, a tilted lens, you, you can easily see it. <clears throat> you can turn this around um, manually it, it or having as a, as a movie turn around um, post-operatively it, it will give you the tilt of, of your IRL um, of, of the optical axis um, just something which which is nice to have if, if you're if you're using um, premium IRLs and, and wondering if, if there is anything off um, after after surgery if the patient is not happy or like if, if you're not sure what has happened. Um, topography, as you are used to them, you, you can actually um, have the parametry as, as you like. So um, that's, that's, that's my setting or our setting. Um, you, you have anterior elevation, axle, uh, the elevation, the, uh, the axle curvature. Um, you, you can have total power. You have posterior um, axle curvatures, the posterior elevation, and then the parametry. That's, that's the, the image. They, I think they have a standardized preset in, in, in a way that, that way. So that's, that's the, the derived um, topography from, from the OCT, from these scans. And, and obviously you have all the numbers here. You see that's a sim astigmatism of 1.46 diopters in, in 86 degrees. Um, nicely as you're used with, with color imaging, you can preset or change the, the color coding as, as you like. Everything you're used with your topography or tomography machinery um, that, that you're using nowadays. It additionally gives you the, the possibility to, to simulate the, the vision in, in the patient, uh, what, what he has now and, and with different pupil diameters. So you, you can, it's, it's preset uh, on, on to six millimeters. You can preset it yourself. Um, I usually use it in, in a smaller preset. And, and then you have the, the higher and the lower orders uh, aberrations, which you can include or exclude. And actually this will simulate uh, the patient's vision 
as it has been measured. There's there's no simulation yet for for IOLs um, like after after surgery. It's 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 actually the, all the corneal imaging which which is derived here. Um, I have a question: Is this topography available in our machines in Australia? That so Jared and his team is asking if this topography assessment is available in Australia, or uh, is this a part which will be coming that I have to give to answer to Thomas afterwards. I think it is. Yes, it I, is. I can quickly give you the reply. I mean, that's with the next software update that's going to be released in about two weeks time. So end of February, this is also going to be available to everybody in South Australia. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so that, that has been settled. Um, and and that's, that's, that's actually quite nice. And it's on your eye suite. So you don't have to sit in front of the machinery with, with your patient. You, if you have the ISWIT uh, in, in your office, um, it's, it's all connected and, and you can actually have the patient being measured separately somewhere else and, and show this um, later on when, when you do your, your explanation for, for the IOL, for the premium IOL or whatever. Um, it has an imaging device. Obviously, it takes color imaging. It, it measures white to white. It, actually has included as well a uh, true chiotromity. And that's 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 quite nice since I told you before, it, it's all based on the OCT swept source. It, it takes this Mandelin um, pattern. It it measures beautifully everything, but there's still always the question, how how good are SIM case? And and Huxright has included these true chiotrometry LEDs, which we are all used from, from different devices. It, it's the Lenstar or it's, it's an auto refractometer. And, and hence you have an internal comparison of, of your true chiotrometry measurements on the cornea, as well as, as the SIM case, which, which, which gives you two independent measurements in one device, only for, for chiotrometry, for example. Um, I wanna show you the, the study we, we did for for Hark Stride. Um, it's it's actually a very short and, and neat study has it been. We, we included 46 eyes. The these were cataractic eyes, pseudophagic and, and healthy volunteers. We we had the the eye star as as the machinery of, of test and and tested on, on three separate devices. Um, the third one is not here, it's a lens star that, that's been sitting right out of the image here. And, and these are the other two, one, the Pentacam HR and the Atlas size as, as the gold standards um, for, for their own um, top, topography or tomography um, standards. Uh, the order the patients have been measured, it has not always been the same. So it's not the same order that, that they started on the left and always did the right, so, but it was a random order for, for the patients just to, to exclude any, any bias um, in, in this study. And I wanna quickly go through, um, through the, the results with you, show you what, what we found, um, not, not in all details because I'm not gonna bore you too much. It's, it's the axle length measurement. If we compared these with, with the older Lenstar, so Hawkstride's own device, which is still a nice device, um, the, the accuracy um, was, was very high, but in, in repeatability, the the uh, the I star was three times more accurate in the repeatability uh, in in a very little manner. We, we're talking on on axial length um, of of thirteen micrometers versus four micrometers. This is, gives you a three time higher accuracy, but but still, if it's clinically relevant to have thirteen microns in in axial length um, accuracy or four microns, um, makes maybe sometimes a different. Um, at least for for technological um, development, it, it shows that that the new laser is is highly more accurate and actually significantly more accurate than than the older ones. If we continue and, and show you the, on this on on the Bland Altman, um, you see the different lens. It's 21 and a half millimeters up to 26 and a half millimeters. All patients and, and probands included, and this is a perfect fit. On the two devices, um, this is this is in the blend element. No, it gives you the two standard deviations, um, the outliers on 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 a few micrometers. That's that's really um, not not something to to worry about. So perfect accuracy between the two devices. Um, always one could say you you cannot become better than than the ISO or the Lenstar. 
um, that's, that's been with optical biometry, really, really nice. Anterior chamber, not surprisingly, same thing because it takes the same measurements. It's about two, time, two and a half times uh, more accurate in the repeatability, sorry, <laughs> than, than the lens star. Um, and again, the blunt Altman, you see there's, there's one outlier here. Um, at what's that at about 3.2 millimeters anterior chamber depth um, for whatever reason we we didn't actually look into that because it's it's not a not a significant outlier um but again perfect fit you see there's there's nothing to to very lens um thickness same thing three times more accurate in in the repeatability um and, and as you can see we we had some cataract lenses which which were nicely in thick five and a half millimeters the thickest one these are not natural lenses these are the iols and you can see actually it, it's all been done on the automatic measurement um the iols which which are below a millimeter thick in the eye it takes them nicely as well um so there's there's really nothing to to worry in in that device i quickly go into the chat and look what what the questions are um thomas has answered oh okay sorry just wanted to make sure that i'm not missing any questions and i'll continue um corneal thickness in that study again compared to the the ISTA, um a little bit better um not much the cornea is, is thin like I don't show you the blunt Altman doesn't doesn't matter. There's there's a nice correlation, a perfect fit on corneal thickness. Um, going into keratometry, we we compared the the eye star with the lens star, um, and and there's again um, almost perfect fit. You see here in the in the upper case, um, there it starts to to deviate a little bit, um, but but still there's there's no significant difference in, in keratometry between the eye star and the lens star. Um, perfect device, nicely. Um, if we compare this with, with Pentacam, um, accuracy also a little bit higher, not, not significantly. Um, little deviation up in the higher case, same patients as at or province, as I told you. Um, absolutely reliable. And here I have to say, this was case, true case against SIM case in the Pentacam. If you look at um, sim case versus sim case, uh, it's, it starts a little bit to disperse a little bit more because sim case, as we know, um, can can tend to have uh, a little can be a little bit off. That's that's why I told you having the true case in in the device actually is is, is perfect. For example, in the Pentacam, you only have sim case, um, so that's 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 one of the, the advantages of of the iStar, I think. When we look at the, the back SIM case for, for back measurements, there's, there's only um, simulated keratometries versus the Pentacam. Uh, again, there is a correlation. It, it, it's a little bit dispersed and a bit, little bit wider in the Blunt Altman, but, but still, is, there's, a, there's a perfect fit and, and uh, it, it, it's much less. It, it, it comes into calculation for the, for the true power, the absolute power, but um, the, the posterior measurements are, are actually more interesting also for diagnostic purposes, for example, in keratoconic patients or ectatic other ectatics. But having said so, I don't want to bore you with, with all the results. You, you would expect that, that a, a nice study should, should show superiority or at least a non-inferiority in, in that new device and more, much more modern device than, than in, in, in the competitors' uh, devices and the older devices. And, and I want to show you a, a young patient or a youngish patient uh, because the, the extremes are, are where the things are made and, and show you actually the beauty of, of that device. This is a congenital anidiric patient I've, I've seen in an end of last year. Um, she has a bilateral ptosis, complete aniridia, uh, short, short eye, um, 21.5. 11 millimeters on the right and the same thing on the left side. Very shallow interior chamber, um, nice cataract. She obviously has, has nystagmus as, as all these congenital aneuridic patients have if they have bad vision. 
Um, so with the ptosis, with the nystagmus, and, and having an eye which is rather, the cornea rather flat, short, um, this, this, is a, this is a challenge, a challenging uh, eye to, to measure. And that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, the, the machinery actually gives you all the, the results and, and, and warns you, these are actually correct measurements. The anterior chamber in, in that patient has been as shallow as, as it has been shown. Um, if, if you look, this is the anterior chamber with the corneas, it's 2.24 millimeters. And if you did use the, the corneal thickness, actually this is a 1.5 um, millimeter anterior chamber due to the cataract and, and uh, the hyperopia in, in this patient. Um, so this is the 80 millimeter, 18 millimeter scan. This is the regular scan for the cataract suite. And as you can see, um, device did beautifully in, in a nystagmus eye, which, which hasn't been properly um, fixating. And as well in a ptotic, ptotic eye, which we had to lift up to actually get that exposed eye and cornea. Um, calculation, that's, that's how you get the printout for, for all the measurements when they transferred and calculated. And that's, that's the setup as, as we use it, as I use it. Um, we have the, the Hoya preset, that's uh, no, no vested interests here. Um, that's the, the IOL, which, which I usually use. And, and you see, you have all the different methods or formulas. This is a, a formula, the Barrett, you have the Hill RBF, which is a method, uh, more of a statistical method, Heiges, Esser, Katik, Hofer, Q, um, on, on, these, on the same IOL. And as expected, you have 1.5, diopters in, in difference in these calculations from the same measurements. Um, uh, if, if, if we would talk directly, I would ask you which one would you choose for in, in a hyperopic patient. Um, we went for, for the Barrett formula with 30 diopter um, IOL, which we had implanted. At the same time, I implanted an art a human optics artificial iris and uh, a, a capsule attention ring I do standardized in, in these patients. Um, so this, these are the results. You, you see hyperopic uh, spherical equivalent of, of 4.75, uh, visual acuity 660, um, implanted the, the 30 diopter and a couple of months later that has been implanted in November or December as far as I remember, um, last refraction was, was, was this year with a spherical equivalent of, of a bit of in the hyperopia. Um, if I go back one up, you see with a 30 day update actually calculated to be on, on, on emetropia. Um, we, we landed a little bit higher up in the hyperopia, still very good for the patient because of the cataract and everything and the artificial iris. But as you can see, um, Heiges or Hoffer-Q in, in this case would have been probably more, more accurate to, to get proper emetropia. But this is a very difficult patient, difficult case. You see also I did the ptosis um, surgery later on. And since I put the artificial iris in, in the back, in these patients, you have the risk of, of glaucoma. That's why I don't put it in the sulcus. Um, you, you have a little rim here where there's translucency, but still the patient has improved tremendously and due to her amblyopia, um, that's, that's where we will end it. And I think that's the maximum she would get. To conclude, um, Hark Stride has, has almost developed the Swiss army knife of devices. Um, that's, I, they, it's, that's, that's my thinking of last night, I, I added this. Uh, it, it includes almost everything. It's, it's a highly automated um, device. Uh, it, it compares absolutely well and beautifully. And, and it, I've shown you, I hope I've shown you that in, in, in special cases, you, you can rely on, on the machinery. And, and actually that's, that's the thing I, I usually use and, and trust uh, for, for all of my patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Goldblum, for your insights there. There's some um, fantastic little little pearls that I'm sure everyone will have thoroughly enjoyed. Um, the next speaker I'd like to introduce um, will be the um, experiences from uh, Dr. Pascal Lamesh, uh, and we'll we'll get that started sh shortly. Good morning, and thank you for letting me talk about our experience with the iStar device. We used for biometry for about 
10 years, the Hawkstrike Lens Star. And I was looking for a better device to take biometry measurements, especially the posterior curvature of the cornea, and also for prediction values for premium lenses, especially toric lenses and multifocal lenses. Um, additionally, I didn't want to take all the biometry measurements by myself, as I did until we had the iStar device. I wanted to delegate that. Um, I wanted basically to routinely measure patients with a topography and biometry, especially also children for a myopia measurement. Um, I wanted to visualize the anterior chamber angle and for this especially optimize patient flow. Um, we evaluated a lot of devices, um, but I don't particularly like Scheinfluke devices. I think that uh, an OCT is a much more modern technology and there is only one competitor to does it all in one. Um, but it's not such a nice device as the iStar device and is not as easily delegatable. What I really like about the iStar device is the ease of measurement. It's fully automated. It's very fast in most patients and completely painless and brainless. So it's easily delegatable and standardized. As you can see here on a measurement, both eyes um, are measured very quickly. There are no distinguishable moving parts on the exterior. Uh, everything is in a nice and compact body. What I also like is once the measurement is taken, which uh, can take a while, uh, especially the calculations, um, is then an extremely well elaborated summary screen where you see basically all details on one view. You have the axial length as well as the details of the anterior chamber. You have a topography of the cornea as well as the uh, lens tilt. Um, if you go into detail, you can easily select all the numbers that you need to calculate your lens as K1, K2 and um, the actual lengths. Um, however, you also see in one view the white to white distance, the pupillary diameter, um, as well as the interior chamber and the axial length, as well as the part where the device detected the retina. And this is very easily, especially in a uh, um, dense cataract, where sometimes it's really hard to find the retinal peak, you can simply visualize it and adapt it manually as well as all <clears throat> measurements of the anterior chamber. Um, you have a very comprehensive and detailed corneal topography, uh, which you can also devise in three millimeters, six millimeter and nine millimeter zones in order to better um, assess the um, axis of the astigmatism and the feature which I love most is the Zernike polynomes as well as a visual simulation with all the um, lower and higher order aberrations uh, with different pupillary diameters. Um, you can easily show the patient 
with the lower order aberrations or with the higher order aberrations, which you can see here, you can take them on and off. You see the corneal topography and at the same time you see for a given pupillary diameter with the selected um, aberrations what the vision simulation might be. This is something which I use extensively with all the patients to explain them what they can expect from the cataract surgery. So all in one, um, I think it's a very comprehensive and easy overview of all the measurements that you might need, which helps you a lot in biometry and patient care. Um, additionally, you have the lens tilt, which is quantified, which can help you to make a decision about a premium lens or not. Um, additionally, what I mentioned in the beginning, it is a very compact um, device, which fits almost in every corner. You can move the screen wherever you want to have it ergonomically, and there are no discernible moving parts on the outside. The patient is just one big box where he looks into it. What I did not like in the beginning, in the beginning the measurement was slowly slow um, and sometimes error prone with a lot of um, warnings. We didn't know what was really wrong and there were some um, things missing from the device. <clears throat> However, I have to say, I have never seen a company react as quickly um, to our feedback as Hawks tried. They came literally daily to check on the machine. Um, they looked at all the locks with all the mistakes. They had software updates almost weekly um, and added all the features that we requested. So um, I have to say the improvement was almost immediate and uh, we didn't use the lens star after a couple of months at all but relied completely within the eye star and uh, delegated all the measurements we now have even the eye star uh, in a different part of the building where the patients are measured by a technician and they don't need me at all i can just look at the data advise the patient and make my decisions so um, I have to say now after about two years using the iStar, we are extremely happy with it. I have only one problem, which is what do I do with the LensStar? Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, it was uh, interesting to see the, the insights of someone as an early adopter of this exciting technology. It's fantastic seeing uh, how it's uh, changed and improved and, uh, and helped with patient outcomes. Without further ado, I'd now like to welcome Thomas Butler to the floor to share with us a technical overview of the ISAR 900. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Jared, for the introduction and thank you for the real nice insights my two previous speakers already gave. And there's almost nothing I could add, but um, I'll do my best to give you a real overview on what the ISO can also do, and a little bit more on the technical details, um, what the device provides you with. So what is the iStart and features and benefits and some technical details, which we're going to share with you. So what is this iStart really? I mean, my pre previous speakers already told you it really is a multimodality device. It provides you with OCT data of the anterior chamber. It provides you with high precision, all eye biometry, and topography of the corner front and the back surface. So it's a visualization, measurement, and diagnostic tool 
at your hands, fully automated and easy to delegate for the acquisition step. So you can really use your time with the patient to discuss what you see on the data. So <clears throat> then I would like to have a little bit more, oops, sorry, that was the wrong, wrong way, a little bit more on this. So what does this mean anterior segment visualization with OCCT? We can provide you with full images on the DOAs, on the data. So with the iStar and um, David Goldblum already mentioned this, we're using a little bit different technology to scan. We are not using line scan stacks or radial scans like uh, most other devices do, but we use a Mandalay scan pattern. With this scan pattern, we can also provide you with radial or line scan stacks after the acquisition on any section of the eye. Then we have the corneal topography. So you have topography of the corneal front, corneal back. You have pachymetry information all at your hands at dispose after measurements. So you can always look at it. Also later on, you can do follow-ups. You can see progression there. Then you have the biometry, which you've already seen. That's the overview screen with the biometry from the corner to the retina, every compartment. Then we have the topography with it. We have real reflective keratometry for the anterior corner. We have then the OCT-based posterior keratometry included and also assessment of the anterior chamber, including lens tilt. And last but not least, we are having the AOL calculation there. We feature basically all the state-of-the-art calculations from the 21st century. So it's Barrett, it's Olsen, it's Hill RPF, everything available at hand at your disposal. Okay, so let's go a little bit more into the details and look at it. So what is the advantage or why did we choose swept source technology for the device? So first of all, we want to make sure that you can see what you get, that you don't have to rely on just an A scan, just an intensity plot with uh, mountains and valleys, that you really see the anatomy. Then it's full range device. So from the corner to the retina, it's one single scan. There's no stitching with it, no combination of different scan ranges. And the whole thing is done in really high speed, which improves the patient comfort. With improved patient comfort, we have improved patient compliance. And this all improves also the precision of the measurements because the patient is more relaxed and also more compliant with the acquisition. That's just a few examples. Also, David showed you some examples. What you can see on the device, we have cataractus lenses, we have an IOL, or we have an ICL here, which you can see. And the long range really means that we can cover on the cornea up to 18 millimeter from the vertex. And we go back to the retina, but as also mentioned by my previous speakers, the retinal image you see here is basically just a line because of the imperfection of the eye. It's refraction correct, but it also shows a little bit more than just a point, it shows a little bit of a line there. But you have the full image from the anterior chamber with chamber angle, with the lens, which is uh, visible through the iris and then the retina. It's really fast, so we can do a bilateral measurement below one minute for the measurement acquisition time. This is motivating for your technicians because it's easy. And it's also motivating for your patients because patient comfort is high. They don't have anything that moves into their face. It's all self-contained, fully covered, and then makes it more easy to them to comply with what the technician tells them. You have the all-eye biometry, the full topography, pachymetry, all with it. One device fully automated. So the Mandalay scan pattern, David told you about this. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. The Mandalay scan pattern is what you see here in this schematics. It's basically a continuous radial scan. So you do circles that always go to the apex, but they have intersections all over. So what's the difference? The standard devices usually do radial scans, like on the left, where you do a vertex-centered radial scanning pattern with just line scans. 
In the center, the spacing is narrow, it's really dense, but to the periphery, it becomes more and more wide with the spacing, and therefore you have less information as you go out to the periphery. The Mandalay scan pattern, on the other hand, is also very dense in the center, but it has an almost even distribution of density on the measurement points throughout the complete cornea, and we have intersections on the cornea everywhere. And this enables us to do motion compensation on the OCT images. So we don't have to rely on a um, video uh, eye tracker, but we can do the motion compensation inherently in the OCT signal. And also because we have such a high density throughout the complete measurement volume covered, we can do A scans, we can do B scans, we can do line scans, after the acquisition everywhere in the volume and don't have to rescan the patient if I want to see a detail later on. So we have the OCT in here motion compensation, as mentioned. We have high density of the measurement points. It's all OCT based. And because of this, we can have now a type A standard topographer also included with this OCT device. And we can do virtual B scans basically everywhere, anytime. That's basically just a graphical representation of what we do and what it just told you. If you look at this, another nice feature about the Mandalay scan pattern, the way we do the motion compensation is that we also increase again the density of the measurement points. On the left side, you see basically what happens before the motion compensation. The OCT as well as the eye image is blurred because that's the way you get the data with the trajectory just as it's scanned on the eye without any motion compensation. And the trajectory is nicely. You can see the Mandalay lines nicely. But then when we do compensate for the motion, the Mandalay scans are not as nicely any longer. But you can see because they are all correct for the little uh, saccades of the eye or for patient eye motion, they are actually moved a little bit, and it has increased, again, the intensity of measurement points available for the assessment of the data later on. So that's a nice little side effect of the OCT inherent motion compensation that you have actually more data in the end. Okay, so then the high precision swept source OCT biometry, what's the advantage of this? I already told you, you don't have just an A scan or a B scan you have the combination of it. And what's the beauty of that? So if you would have just a device like the LensStar where you have an A scan available, you see that this for sure is not a fake patient, but a pseudo fake patient. We have on the left the cornea, we have somehow the IOL, we have the retinal peaks with the RP and the ILM. And we see here in the IOL portion, there's something strange. We have three peaks instead of just two, which you would expect. But what is the implant here? That's really the question, or what is this additional peak here? I don't really know. Only by adding the information from the B scan, I can see now what happened with this particular patient. We see the cornea, we see the iris, then we see the IOL, and we see that there was some liquid trapped behind the IOL and in between the posterior capsular bag. And this really helped here because now, the doctor just went there, he could open up the posterior capsule bag, the liquid could go out and the lens moved into the correct place, improved the vision of this particular patient quite well. And we also have an overlay view where you can see the A and the B scan on top of each other, just to double check, is everything there where it should be? Then for the keratometry, we decided to have two modalities with the I star. All measurements of the I star are basically OCT based, but the keratometry there we have also a reflective keratometry included, which is based on the same technology like the lens star with the 32 reflective points, where we do have the dual zones with 1.65 and 2.3 millimeter optical coverage. And why did we do this? Basically, we said this is a cataract, but also AC analysis device. But for cataract, you really need to get the best possible keratometry values to start with. And 
because you can still match OCT case, simulated case versus reflective case on the individual patient, you will see differences. And that's why we introduced the reflective keratometry also with the I-STAR to have the best possible K readings for the IOL calculation. The reason for this patient individual difference is the database for reflective K and for the SIM case from OCT is different. For reflective case, you basically fit a shape into the reflections, which already has the keratometry um, guidelines in it with the two meridians, which are perpendicular to each other. On the same case, you first rely on elevation data, on height data, like in a topographic map, and then you derive from this uh, simulated keratometry. And this can be in average the same, but on the individual patient, you might see some differences. Then we have topography with the unit. We have topography for the corner front, for the corner back. We have pachymetry, everything is there. We can go out to 12 millimeter with the AC suite. The topography of the cataract suite is 7.5 millimeters. So basically also a fully blown topographer. Based on this data, we have then also the possibility to look at the Cernicke analysis to really see every single uh, source of visual impairment on the patient. We can do vision simulation and use this for patient education, as Pascal Imesh already said in his talk. And let's have a quick look at an example here. That's a pretty standard case for cataract patient. We have standard axial length, standard corneal thickness, maybe a little bit thin, but still in the normal range, normal anterior chamber, normal lens, and also the keratometry looks okay. We have some astigmatism, 1.5 diopter, might be a candidate for a low power toric. But if I just have this information, I don't know how the astigmatism looks like. So if we add now topography, this again improves the decision-making process. What we see here immediately is that this patient doesn't really have a very nice astigmatism, but it's slightly bent like a banana. Still, it might work with a toric, who knows? One feature we also have with the eye star is zone-based keratometry. So we have then for the center three, the intermediate three to five, and the peripheral five to seven millimeter optical zones, uh, individual keratometry measurements, which are not limited to have just one steep and one flat meridians, but we have two steep and two flat meridians, which are not necessarily 90 degrees to each other, but which show where the flat and the steep areas looks like. So if you look here, we see that for a three millimeter pupil, we still have a quite nice astigmatism, but in the intermediate zone, because of this banana shape, we already see that there is not so much uh, normal signals any, any longer. Then if we go on, we can also look at this in the Cernike view, in the vision simulation view. As said, Cernike, we can really look at all the visual effects in parameters. And here in this particular patient, we can show the patient by switching on and off the low water operation. So basically here it is the astigmatism and then tell him, well, if you take a toric at night, that's what you can expect. It's an improvement, but it's not perfect because you see here, six millimeter pupil, night vision, we have the banana shape that really goes into play here. Now, if I change the pupil diameter to three millimeter, mimicking day vision, we see that the asymmetry of the astigmatism here is not so important any longer because I don't cover the full range any longer. And I have, again, a much better uh, visual uh, appearance implanting a toric because now all the coma effects, which we had with the six millimeter pupil here are lower. The astigmatism is still there and plays the main role and this can be corrected by a toric. So I can get the patient's expectation right, or I can also um, make sure that the patient who really insists on a particular lens is then guided to maybe a better choice for him, which might be in the standard lens and monovision, for example, instead of a multifocal. This can all be done here and helps patient education. Okay. <clears throat> then, already mentioned by David as well, we do have assessment of lens tilt, also a nice feature if you plan to implant premium IOLs, just to make sure 
that you have a standard situation. We have the IOL, we have the lens tilt uh, tool available for faking patients, but also for assessment of IOL implantation. So for pseudo faking patients, that's all there. You can look at it, you get numbers of it, and also how well the IOL is centered or the crystalline lens is centered. Then some additional side marks. They are also covered by my previous speakers, but I just quickly go over them again. It's quick, it's easy to delegate. It's really one of the points we stressed out well. Well, during the development, we wanted to have a device that can be placed in the, in the front desk with the technical staff that can do the data acquisition quick and easy. And then the data can be transfer, transferred to the eye care specialist, which then can do the counseling with the patient looking at the data. Then we also wanted to make sure that we can always fit in every space. The unit itself has a small footprint and you can move the screen, which is the, um, the user interface on every side. So depending on your uh, space limitations, you can have it on the right or left patient side, or you can even have it on the back. The unit can also be fit on a instrument table like down here where everything is on it, the PC is in it. So if you get the unit out of the box, you power it on and it runs. So again, the iStar is really a multimodal imaging, biometry, topography device. So you can do everything you could do with multiple devices up to now in a single fully automated device, which is easy to delegate, which can be networked. And therefore the data can be looked at everywhere in your practice. Okay, so that's just in a nutshell what you can expect from an iStar. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, a detailed and exciting summary of this brilliant device. I particularly enjoyed learning about the combination of the imagery and the data and the benefits that that's going to bring to our clinicians. That rounds out our guest speakers for this evening and I'd like to now open the uh, the floor to questions so if you'd like to um, uh, pop your your questions in in the chat we'll we'll direct those as as necessary um, I've uh, got a couple here that uh, came from the from the floor for people that couldn't necessarily make it so I might start to, to Professor Goldblum um, the, uh, the the incidence and, and preference for um, extended depth of focus and uh, and premium IOLs here in Australia is, is certainly growing. Um, and with an understanding that lens tilt can certainly play a significant role in the, the outcomes uh, for the patient with, with those type of lenses. How have you found that uh, you've used them and do you have any comments on uh, the analysis features within the iStar and um, how that's, that's worked in your practice? The, the lens tilt has, has, has not changed too, too much in, in, in prospective of, of implanting premium IOLs. Um, it's 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 rare that they, that you were really really off um, if beforehand, and and if you are, you probably see it clinically or you know it. Um, it 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 is nice to 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 see if if there is a refractive <clears throat> surprise or or anything not not proper with the patient and the lens centration. Although you you had nice surgery, so um, the the lens still still. Um, is, is, is something nice for, for science and, and research uh, in, in special cases in, in your day-to-day -day practice. It, it might be not that relevant in, in advance, but having said so, in, in, in surprising cases, you, you might be very happy to, to use it. Um, the, the simulation, as, as Pascal has, has shown you, um, is, is certainly something which, which is nice to have for, for these patients since, since you can visualize and simulate what, what somebody can expect and, and cannot expect um, and, and hence you, you use your time well and it's, it's visualizing actually nicely what, what the patient can expect with different settings of lighting um, and, and, and also what, what he or she has in, in the case for, for like uh, what, what has probably been what Thomas has shown us, uh, a keratoconic case, um, if, if you would do the surgery in, in that patient and, and then you, you manage patient expectations with that. Fantastic, thank you. 
Uh, another one that we've been given uh, in advance is some um, that uh, operator usability can play a, a major role in the uh, the choice of, of IOLs and, and the measurements that's obtained. Um, how, what feedback have you had from your your clinical team in the uh, the, the capture process? Um, they they in the beginning they they were. So surprised about the automatism. So um, it, it's actually that that automatic that the the, the well um, used nurses and, and technicians uh, they said I don't have to do anything um, and and I don't control anything. The machinery does everything. Um, I, I'm not sure what's happening. So <laughs> the the the. the the non nurses, they 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 have to adapt in the beginning since they 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 used to the joystick and then settling if you have the IOL Master Five Hundred or anything, um, Heidelberg uh, OCT machineries. Uh, this this is fantastic. Uh, if you have new opticians, nurses, technicians, they they just sit the patient in front of it and say it's fantastic. I don't have to do anything. It's it's just keeping the patients still and sometimes helping up. So yes, we it's it's it for I'd say for for new. For younger, pay, uh, younger staff, it's it's absolutely perfect. Um, but you have to trust your machinery. You, you don't fiddle around anymore. Um, it's it's just working by itself. Indeed, yeah, very good. Um, doesn't look like there appears to be any more coming through. We might just uh, wait a, a couple more seconds in case there's others that uh, uh, want to want to speak up and and pop some in the in the chat there. Perfect. So um, the uh, the question that's come through is, uh, what are the tolerance in degrees for lens tilt uh, for premium and multifocal IOLs? <laughs> if if I knew, I would I would tell you. I don't know. Can't give you an answer on that. Maybe Thomas has has some insight. Yeah, I, I've been given a rule of thumb basically from some surgeons that really want to look at this uh, topic that they say if it's really above five degrees, if it's if above seven degrees, something like that. So it, it's not a fixed number. So if it's really just extensive, this is what we can say for sure. If it's unusual, if you look at it, you see a high tilt, then you would consider, well, talk to the patient, look you have a pretty unusual biometric setup in your eye and having a multifocal lens might lead to issues. I mean, there have been several studies done already on um, other devices, not yet the, the eye star because that's not to be enabled at, at this point of time, that tried to correlate pre-op and post-op um, tilt of the crystalline and the IOL lens. And the correlation is there, but it's not something that you can, at the moment, at least with the old data, go to a point where you can correlate it at a nice point of time. We hope that we can do this with the ISO, but these studies are still ongoing. So it's really difficult to say that's the borderline, but if it's extensive, then better talk to the patient and get the expectations right. Exactly. There's, there's, there's more questions coming in, Jared. Um, yes, please do. Calculation speed going to be fast in the future. It has already been, been increased. Um, the calculation speed. So that I have to say, um, I've I've been working with with Harkestride for the last twenty five years, uh, also on on the Lenstar, um, and and they they always keep increasing as we've heard with Pascal, um, their their software. It, it has been increased and it's it's it still is. It, it has it has a lot of data. Um, it's it's not too long anymore. So. The way the patient uh, gets up and, and makes his way into the doctor's office, you, you have the calculation done. So it's it's not something which takes minutes and minutes and ages. Um, it's 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 just not on the screen just immediately or after the after the measurement. It takes I don't know how much um, a minute now. Not even. Hey, Thomas, do you have any comments there? Thomas? Yes, sorry, my mouse was <laughs> just died on me. Okay, sorry. Uh, with respect to the analysis time, the analysis time currently is forty seconds after the assessment of the uh, acquisition of the data. So the acquisition is one part, which is below forty seconds right now, and then the analysis 
till you have everything on the screen is again about 40 seconds. Yes. And we're talking always two eyes. Two eyes, yeah. Bilateral measurement completes done everything available at, at your hand, yes. Yep. That's him. Uh, certain induced astigmatism, yes, it can be, of course, it can be um, put into the software. Um, into the vision simulation, I, I am, I don't think it's it's, it it's it's not yet part of the vision simulation, but we are considering quite some new features there. I mean, we you want to have integration of lens tilt, that's an idea, then the SIA for sure is also part of it, but that's still under assessment and also development. For the moment, we have the simulation as you, as you could see it, but we are working on improved ways to show what the patient can expect here. And I guess the, the last one is also one question for me, if uh, you can integrate in a markerless alignment system. For the moment, you can export the data to the Alcon system, and we are also working on systems from Hawkstride there as well. Fantastic. Well, that uh, brings our, uh, our evening to an end. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, involved and everyone for, uh, for joining us. Um, I hope you all have a, a great evening and uh, talk to us soon. Should you have any other questions that you haven't considered, our team is certainly here to, uh, to help with, uh, with any questions that you may, may have. Um, so feel free to, uh, to reach out following that. Otherwise, good evening. Thanks very much.